Hey guys, and today I'll be playing Vile Strangers, where a strange masked man won't stop staring at you at the bus stop. I'm guessing this is the weird masked man with obvious blood oozing from his mask. Bus stop, 8.45pm. Ugh. <laughs> the man next to you at the bus stop covers his nose and waves a hand in your general direction. Absolutely vile. You want to take a shower and use soap for once in your life. So rude. Your eye twitches at his condescending tone. His voice filled with judgment, which is to be expected considering it's coming from a guy in a fancy suit. Oh, how flattering. Just what I need to hear after working in nine plus hours. You think I'm tired of noise before flipping him off when he turns his back towards you. He's still gagging, filling up his disgust as he creates a large amount of distance between you two. Although not going too far, so he can still catch the bus you're both waiting for. He's probably the source that's never changed a diaper. You're certain of it. You sigh and lean against the small bench you parked yourself into, when you couldn't remain standing any longer. Lifting your arm, you sniff yourself and then wrinkle your nose. Okay. The jerk might have a point. You smell like a mix of blueberry slushy with hints of chocolate sundae thrown in. Not a bad combination. At least not until you take into account that the scent mostly stems from someone vomiting all over your poor uniform. Oh, no wonder. You try to wash off and wring your suit out in the bathroom sink as best as you could, but... Yeah, this shirt's probably coming out of your paycheck. Maybe the smell didn't bother you so much since you've gotten used to it. <laughs> throwing people throwing up in you is a common occurrence? Currently, you look at Bobby's and Bibbles, a family entertainment center that offers arcade games and irregular amounts of greasy foods that make your own stomach churn since you know how it's all prepped. Oof. You're 100% certain your workplace has violated about a dozen health code protocols. Take yesterday afternoon, for instance. Your hand had a literal you had a literal staring contest with a mouse stealing cheese off an uncooked pizza before it ran off. Heading for a clear cutout hole in the wall with open access to the counter. And despite telling the manager about this, the manager demanded the pizza still get served. Oh no, I'll get the health coat. Help, help bring some people on this. Did they even opt to throw it out? Just argued that there was no time and then retreated back to their office. That's crazy. And that's not even the worst of the offenses. Most of them were far more disgusting, but you've turned a blind eye to each time. Well, not that you have much of a choice. Your step steeped in student loans, and this is the only job that accepted you after months of endless searching. So in the end, you've learned to grit your teeth and bear it. You sigh again, letting your head rest against the back of the wooden bench, your head tilted up towards the darkened sky. All you today is almost over. You tell yourself. What more can happen? And then you wince because as soon as anyone says or even thinks those words, shit always hits the fan. You look over at the man standing far away from you. He's actively ignoring your presence, which is fine by you since he's probably not going to be the thing that makes your night end up worse because you decide to jinx yourself. Maybe the buses could wind up running late then? You try to predict the terrible luck that will befall you when you hear harsh and heavy footsteps. You glance over. And holy shit, the guy walking towards you is huge. A massive bulk of a man. You're, you need climbing gear just to see him at eye level. He's that tall. It's intimidating. When he makes a grunting noise, you crane your neck to look up at his face. But he's wearing something over it. Like a mask? Oh, please say <laughs> say this guy isn't resolve your self-inflicted jinx. He's just some party girl, right? Probably with the costume theme, considering his apron that looks like there's a few red splotches right on the... The you are screwed alarm start ringing your head, sirens going off left and right, as your brain scrambles and tries to determine whether or not those are actual blood splatters or simple dollops of ketchup made to look like blood. Try to recall if you've ever seen anything on the news or true crime crime panels about mass murders in your area. But if you're being honest, the crime rates are astronomical in your city. 
Despite the fact that you're currently near the outskirts, the place is a festering cesspool of criminals all congregating together in one area, and not even here safe. Put your fist on your lap. Looking away, you see that the other man waiting for the bus walked off somewhere. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so now you're all alone with this guy. Maybe he's nice? The hokey man doesn't say anything as he lowers himself onto the bench next to you. You can hear him breathing. Long, drawn-out breaths punctuating the quiet. An involuntary shiver crawls down your spine. You scooch towards the other end of the bench, making as much space as possible between you and the hulking man. It's then that your brain finally decides to remember the news report from this morning. The body of a 34-year-old man, identified as Raymond Maverick, was discovered strung up inside the gazebo of a Winterberry Park yesterday evening by a young woman jogging in the area. Reports say that his wounds... You slosh your thought with a fury shake of your head. No, that won't happen to you. You can't. Because that's... Your brief sin of denial gets cut off by the sudden mo moment out of the corner of your eye. The masked man go cocks his head slowly, surely noticing how you stiffen. Your body goes from rimrod straight and locking into a tight quiver of fear and discomfort. He's staring right at you. His breathing goes heavier, as though your response excites him. A loud, resonant sound reflected into the silence of the night. You can't even hear the sounds of the city in the far-off distance from where you're positioned, like everything's frozen in time between you and this man in this moment. Out of the corner of your eye, you catch sight of his hand twitching. You finally turn your head towards him, trying to keep your trembling under wraps as you shove your quaking hand between your legs, knowing full well that if he attacks you, you're practically defenseless. What the hell was that damn bus? Shouldn't it have shown up by now? He cocks his head to the other side as you hold his gaze. At the moment in time, you really wish you took your trust, trusty old ballistic knife with you as an extra precaution, but your knife wasn't in any shape to offer protection right now, and besides, he didn't know you encountered someone like this on your way home from work. You're cheering on your, sh on your shit Sunday. And again, would a knife even bring him down with his muscles to act as a barrier? You could take on a normal sized guy, but him? Jabbing him with something sharp might end wind up feeling more like a splinter or a toothpick, and you probably wouldn't even reach his vitals if you went toe to toe. Yeah, the best thing you could do is avoid the worst case scenario. You turn your head away. The movement junky and awkward, and the pressure of being so intensely watched making you subconscious about everything you do. You're seriously considering leaving at this point. There's plenty of cheap hotels within City Lemons willing to let you stay for a night. A reasonable option, and one you're heavily considering. At least, until you remember that you've got a list of things to do when you get home that you can't exactly hold off of. Doing so is out of the question. A second idea comes to mind you think about just walking home, hightailing it on the long stretches of the sidewalk, your path lit only by a few flickering streetlights. Well, I, that's even worse. You can handle walking a few miles in favor of a big, in favor of big and scary over here. But what if he follows you? Then you're even further away from other witnesses. But at that rate things are going, you're not even sure if the bus will show up at any time soon. It's a possibility that the bus broke down on route. It's a hard decision to make. Stay here and endure the creepy lucky man, or walk home and risk him following you. Either way, you need to make a choice. Nah, we gotta make a choice. <laughs> walking home is such a bad idea. But, you know, screw this, you're walking home. You have to travel home by foot rather than staying next to this freaky stranger any longer. Pulling yourself up from the bench, you avoid eye contact with the masked man, choosing to keep your eyes focused on the road ahead of you. You listen out for footsteps as you move away from the bus stop. But after a few minutes of walking, there's no sign of the odd man pursuing you, the echo of footsteps only coming from your own worn-out sneakers. You sigh of relief. The night air is brisk, a cold chill on your skin. Above, 
Storm clouds gather and merge, sure to bring in an on oncoming storm. Thunder claps overhead and you frown as water begins to pour from the sky, adding yet another obstacle to your trek home. Then, a twig snaps and you freeze. Did the man follow you after all? Hesitate a moment before turning around, searching through the darkness for any sort of mass figure. You find no choice of him or anyone else. Swallowing hard, you force yourself to try and get rid of the paranoia as you continue your way down the empty streets. But for some reason, every little sound sets you on edge. A deep-rooted fear of something lurking in the darkness, ready to spring at you when the moment presents itself. You imagine those strung-up body parts belonging to Raymond replaced with your own, your body hallowed out like the guts stripped out of a pumpkin. A shudder runs through you. You don't consider yourself to be a terrible person. In fact, you even tried to return some good to the world in your own way. But others will argue against the good you do. Maybe they'll even go as far as... Your thoughts are interrupted as you hear a slight dragging sound. You peer behind you, but no one's standing there. Did you hear wrong? Finally, you glance back to the road ahead before your gaze lands on something standing off in the distance. A vague human shape. You recognize the businessman from earlier. But what's he doing here? As you begin approaching him, you feel as though something is not quite right, an uneasy feeling spreading throughout your gut. For some reason, he's staring in the direction of your house, which you can see in the off distance. He remains immobile despite the ongoing storm. Oh, he's the killer. You can't even see his chest rise and fall as he breathes. It's creepy and unsettling, and you're starting to regret your decision to walk home. But you're almost there, so you might as well just shuffle past him and try not to make eye contact or encourage any sort of attention. You're relieved when the businessman doesn't react as you walk by. But then you realize something odd. In his breast pocket, a wilted red rose peeks out when you frown at the sight. Why would a businessman have a red rose sitting there? Then again, maybe there's some plausible explanation and you're just looking too deeply into things. But right as you pass him, you feel something clap around your wrist, and as you look over your shoulder, you see the man staring at you with a hardening expression. There's something familiar about his face that you can't quite place. Like you've seen him somewhere before. But before you can react, something sinks deep into your gut. You gasp. It burns. The man then shoves you back, and you stumble off of the sidewalk and into the middle of the street, holding onto your stomach as you try to process what's happening. Will you draw up your hand to see if, if it's stained with blood? As your gaze meets the man's again, he takes out the bolted rose and tosses it towards the front of your feet. You look down at it with a confusion. Right before you hear the blaring horn of a butt, and your body is pulled under and crushed beneath the bus's wheel, your entire body pinned beneath the hulking steel. As your world turns dark, all you can ask is, why? The heck? So the businessman was the creepy killer. Back here again, so staying might not be the worst thing because the bus came anyway. Stay by the very least, create some space between you two. You're fine getting right here. It's creepy and unsettling, but he hasn't tried anything yet. An oddball, but there's plenty of those currently living in the city who pose no inherent harm to others. You convince yourself you're acting overdramatic. Regardless, you decide to get up off the bench in order to create some distance between you two. You busy yourself, acting like you're stepping away to sort through the inside of your bag, not searching for anything in particular, but using it as a prop to appear like you're uninfected by his presence. You keep within sight just in case the bus comes barreling past when there's a soft creak originating from the bench. Then you hear the crunch of gravel of footsteps stepping into the asphalt, nearing closer and closer, still making you break out in cold sweat. Crunch. Step. Crunch. Step. Your hand freezes in your bag. He's headed straight towards you. Stand up his lumbering approach, approach drawing near. Crunch. Step. Crunch, step. You wince at the heavy clunk of his boots, 
Reminded of the possible force he could use against you. His entire body shaped like a weapon built to crush those smaller than him. Crunch, step, crunch. He pauses and you know he's right behind you. The shadow he casts underneath the yellow glow of the street light consumes the entirety of yours, swallowing you whole and making you disappear completely. This feels like the beginning of a campy slasher movie, yet it's your unfortunate reality. You want to believe he's a prankster, someone who gets a kick out of messing with strangers? So weirdo. But there's so many terrible people that you encountered and endured in this world that you can't convince yourself otherwise, despite imagining to do a, so a few minutes before. Because now he's right behind you, and you feel a hand clamp down on your shoulder. The hairs in the back of your neck stand at the uh, attention. You let out a small gasp and watch as a masked man's shadow moves, his free arm rising and lifting up while horrific theories of what he's holding cycles through your head. You don't want to stick around and find out. Finally, your brain kicks into gear. Before you can do whatever he's about to do, you dart out from underneath his hand and make a run for it. Must be damned, you're not staying for a second longer. You walk towards the direction of the city. Your sneakers slap against the harsh pavement of the cracked sidewalk, your canvas bag banging painfully into your hip, but you ignore the pain because you can hear him. The stomp of a boots? He's running after? You're right to fear him. Because now he's giving chase. He's eating up the distance between you two. You know he is because of how long his legs are. One of his strides probably matching three of yours. And he's breathing like a heavy too. You're faint from screaming. You won't so won't serve any purpose other than making you lose previous amounts of oxygen that you could use for running away from the masked man. Not to mention you doubt there's anyone around to hear you. Not unless that man who gagged you at, gagged at you earlier is still hanging around somewhere, but there's no sign of him. Oh, thank goodness. And even then, he probably turned tail at the sight of you screaming and the figure chasing after you because you know guys like him, and they're not in the habit of helping others, especially when their lives are out of line. You're alone in this. And he's still breathing. The masked man breathes. Oh my god. You grit your teeth as you pump your arms and legs faster. The cold bite of the air whips rushes past you and stings your face and cheeks. A splash of something wet splashes against the back of your hand as you propel yourself body forward with each step, with every body getting heavier and heavier the longer you run. Overhead dark green clouds descend, covering the entirety of the sky night sky. There's a rumble and a streak of lightning illuminating the world as rain begins to pour down in heavy sheets. The change in sudden, sudden you find it almost laughable. It's like you're filling out a slasher movie bingo card. What a joke. But you refuse to let the weather keep you from escaping the deranged man who's become even more frantic. Oh, what the heck? He's so much closer now, isn't he? You risk sneaking a glance over your shoulder. That's gonna make you run slower. And scream. Oh god. His arm leans away, your body's almost within grabbing distance, and there's something in his hand that you can't quite make out within the darkness. The only thing you can't see is that the item glints when another violent lightning strike tears across the sky. A weapon. He's got a weapon. You're certain of it now. Turning your head back in the direction of where you're going, you ignore the sharp burning pain in your side from running so long and hard, trying to at least reach the park to see if you can lose him. Any other path will lead you to a dead end. And your body will end up mangled in a ditch somewhere if you give the masked man an opportunity to corner you. Besides, you're the closest to that area now. The body of a 34-year-old man, identified as Raven Ma Maverick, was discovered strung inside the gazebo of Winterberry Park yesterday. No, stop thinking about that. There's no way the same thing will happen to you. Not unless... I was... Wait, get back? <laughs> oh, he's speaking coherent sentences. Hands grasp at the back of your shirt right as you catch sight of the park's entrance and you make a sudden sharp turn to dislodge the man's grasp and send him stumbling towards forward and past you as you make a break for the open gap in the rusted iron fence. Some cut a small human-sized shaped hole into the wires to let people pass through when the gates are locked. 
You think those little property damaging shits, since it's small enough size for you, was not like the bulk of a six eight six six foot eight man that's currently trying to catch up with you. You could jump the fence. He could jump it if he wanted to. You managed to watch as the man hurdles towards you like a linebacker on a football field and your heart sizes in your chest. Turning your body, you frankly squeeze through the gap. Cut wire of the fence tears into the front of your stomach and you let out a yelp. The rusted wire is tearing through the fabric of your uniform. Oh my god. You had to pull out of the other side just in time to watch as the man runs into the fence. You stare at him for a moment, heavy breathing on one side and him on the other, with one of his hands curled around the wire and the other in his pocket. It feels like an eternity. And then you turn tail and flee. Sprinting to the weeds, choking the landscape of the abandoned park. The broken swing set to your left shrieks and complain as the wind tugs and pulls, almost sending the metallic chain lashing at your face as you dart past. You hear the clang of a few of a fence somewhere, and you just know he's climbed over the fence, but you can't see him through the curtain of rain, despite trying to use your hand as a shield in order to keep the water out of your eyes. Then you spot the gazebo. The one where they found the man. You don't hear the newscaster in your head this time, but rather one of your co-workers gossiping to another in the break room while you were scrolling through social media. My sister was on the scene. She said they cut off his limbs and almost made them look like a wind chimes with how they organized his arms and legs. His torso was in the center of it all. They completely disemboweled him. I remember hearing the girl say, right as your foot reaches the bottom step of the gazebo. What about his head? And his hands and feet, usually they identify bodies by dental records and fingerprints and stuff, right? The other co-worker asked around a bite of his sandwich. The memory of his comment asked in sync with you reaching the top step, putting yourself inside the gazebo. The girl telling the story shook her head. They couldn't find him anywhere, although his DNA identified him because of his past criminal history. Her words intermingled with the present with the presence of something catching your wrist. Your scream piercing the air with violence and terror as your body gets forcibly yanked backwards, sending you tumbling towards the ground. Yeah, I know about his records. Talking about a, talk about a scumbag. Your elbow bangs painfully against the rotting floor of the gazebo. He went to jail for abusing his wife or kids or something along those lines, didn't he? You stare up at the masked man with the wide, horrified eyes. He's breathing hard, his fists clenched at his sides, the veins in his arms throbbing as if in anger. He did. You know what I say to that? Asked the memory of your female co-worker, right as the masked man slowly reaches behind him, the thing glinting your peripheral as he draws it out once more. Good. You screw your eyes shut and brace your arms above your head. Riddance. Boom. You crack open one eye and see a palm extended to you. A small little bunny shaped keychain resting in that same hand. Huh? Oh, so you can't really speak? Here you drop this? The masked man says, a breath breathless. Your gaze goes from the man to his hand and then back again. Something seems to click in his head. Sorry, when I reached for you, I almost tripped and grabbed onto the railing for support. But I accidentally dragged you in the process? Here, let me help you up. I don't know, you could have. <laughs> God, that whole chase for nothing. Officially stunned, stun lock, you let the masked stranger help you to your feet. He then observes the scra uh, scrape on your elbow. I'm so sorry, all. He starts patting his pockets before drawing out a bright pastel, pastel pink band-aid and helping you put it on the strap. His pastel color too. Should uh, do for now. He's catching his breath and beginning to form fuller sentences. What just happened? You stare at the masked man with your jaw slightly unhinged before you shake your head and point an accusing finger at him. Wait, so you're telling me that you chased me down like a madman because you wanted to return something? Why didn't you say anything? You scared the living hell out of me. I thought you were trying to kill me, dude. 
Oh. The masked man sounds almost sheepish, and he touches the tip of his pointer fingers together as he looks away. I tried uh, to say something, but you suddenly ran away. I didn't realize you were running because of me. What? Why do you think I was running then? You put your arms over your chest. I thought you were looking for something in your bag and couldn't find it. Oh, you really did think that. So I figured you were racing to get it before the bus showed up. I thought it was the keychain you dropped. It's limited edition, right? He's right. The keychain in question belongs to a show called Little Lucy Lambs. Heard that aired in the early 80s. He's playing a cute and colorful cast of what else? Lambs who often talked about themes of friendship and doing the right thing. Sounds like My Little Pony. Penny, a pink and purple lamb, wound up becoming your favorite despite acting as more of a secondary character. She taught you to always do what you could to help others without expectation of a reward, causing you to look up to her example even now as an adult. Keychain, a reminder of that exact lesson. I wonder if that's what the masked man was thinking too as he chased after you. Finally, you nod to his question and clench the keychain in your fist before putting it into your canvas bag for safekeeping. Selene glances at the masked man as you do. Despite the mask, you can tell his body language that he appears anxious, if not a little shy. Can I ask one last question? You say at last and he jumps a bit, as if surprised you addressed him and then he nods, the movement quick and eager. Before on the bench, why were you staring at me? He fidgets. He touches his mask, playing with the zipper for a moment, before dropping his hand. I... was staring? He asks, uh, having fully regained his voice, no more drawn, long drawn out breaths. You just stare at him, your expression patient but tired. You did go into a full on sprint on your way here after all. Not to mention you had a long day at work. You hear him swallow, the sound reverberating inside his mask. Oh, I'm sorry, I just thought you were pretty and maybe want to sketch out the design for our new mask. He mumbles a little under his breath, voice soft and sheepish, filled with embarrassment as he gives the rotting floors a slight kick. Looking at you kind of inspired me. I haven't felt that spark in a really long time. My mask? Wait, is that why? You meet his revealed gaze and point to his own mask. Yeah, I made this one. They make me feel more comfortable when I wear them because when I usually have my mask off, I can't really... I'm just... Never mind. He toys with his apron and he realizes the splashes of red are likely from some sort of dye he used when creating his mask or possibly even when sketching. The masked man rings the fabric around his fingers. Now that your heart's finally settled and things have calmed down, it hits you that, while socially awkward and somewhat misguided, you see he's not really a bad guy. It's actually kind of sweet how above and beyond he wanted to try and return your keychain which is valuable and hard to replace. Is there anything you recognize my keychain I'm taking it as you're a fan of the show? The masked man perks up. He's doing subtle hops on his feet, now vibrating with energy. I have all 10 seasons on VHS. I sometimes would run into segments with Darla since she got really creative with crafts and making elaborate costumes. I always wanted to become a costume designer when I was a kid. Did you know Darla was actually never supposed to make an appearance in uh He gets himself off mid-sentence. He looks away and rubs the back of his neck. Sorry, I tend to prattle on. You blink at him and then your gaze softens. I don't mind. I actually like learning more about the show. He's practically brimming with joy and can feel it pouring out even with the mask on. You know what it's like having to slide into things you like simply because someone said something negative about it or looked at you weird. Really? Are you sure? I wouldn't say if I didn't mean it. You say. We could talk about it on our way back to the bus stop. Hopefully we could still catch it. By the way, you say as you make your way out of the gazebo. I never did catch your name. The masked man hesitates a moment. All bashful as if he's considering something and he watches to bring his hand to the zipper, drawing it up a little to reveal his mouth. It's Theodore. 
There's a shy smile playing at his lips, and Eddie quickly zips the mask back down all the way again. Feel significant. Can you think back to what you said a few moments earlier in regards to the mask he wears? They make me feel more comfortable when I wear them because when I usually have my mask off, I can't really, I'm just, never mind. Yet despite whatever reservation he seemed to hold about taking off his mask, he unzipped it. Just a little. You don't know why, but a quiet smile finds his way to your lips. As you and Theodore make your way back, he takes his apron off and uses it as a makeshift cover for the both of you to huddle under in order to avoid the onslaught, holding the fabric above his head. He shares factoids about little Lucy Lamb's herd that even you didn't know. Theodore looks animated as he talks, his hand expressive as he gestures around like it's the first time anyone's ever given him permission to just be himself. Kind of adorable. When you reach the bus stop, you arrive at the perfect time, the bus pulling up right beside you two. On the way home, you and Theodore exchange numbers. When you get off the bus, he waves at you through a spot next to the window. He sets himself as Teddy in your phone, and there's a smile playing at your lips as you stare down at the name, already seeing a text from him with a few bear emojis. But then you catch the whiff of a coppery scent, the trail leading straight to the bathroom at the end of the hall, causing you to stiffen. You place your phone into your back pocket and drop your bag. It lands with a heavy thud in the quiet of the house. Silence despite the ongoing storm feels unnatural. No sounds coming in or out. You finally make your way towards the bathroom. The hallway feels so long and tedious to walk down, as if your heart hammers against your chest, violent and all-consuming. Your hand reaches for the doorknob and pauses. You give yourself one second, then two, before you open the door. What the? And greeted by a mess of blood and gore, some of the blood dried along the lip of the tub, and other pieces too thick and congealed. The scent is overwhelming, and you slap your hand over your nose. This is much worse than vomit. Your eyes drift towards a small square sink where a name tag rests, and you force yourself to breathe through your mouth as you step inside, picking up the small square tag. Raven Maverick? Manager. The cute blue bunny that doubles as your job mascot holds balloons in the corner, crusted blood arch along his pink nose and rosy cheeks. This is the entire reason you need to get back home. Wait, you can't put off getting rid of the rest of the evidence. What? What? No way. Can't even put off getting rest of the rest of the evidence since you're sure law enforcement will start digging into your manager's death, and if they find any trace of him or suspect you of killing him, you're done for. You always hate cleaning up after your messes. You don't exactly enjoy killing people. You don't do it for the power or the high, or because you saw it as some sort of sick fantasy. You do this because putting an end to people like Raymond always proves necessary for the pain it caused to those around them putting an end to their cruelty when the law refuses to. You love people like Maverick. They bring out the worst in you and you wield that burning hatred towards them like a weapon. It wasn't even the rumors at your job that alerted you to his abusive behavior, but something you witnessed in the parking lot after you were just gotten off to your evening shift, watching a sm as a small SUV careen past you. You grind your teeth as you remember what he did to his wife in, front in the front seat, Watching as mascara ran down her face, one of his hands tangled in her hair, as the other gripped the steering wheel of the car. The veins in his neck pulsed and throbbed, his face entirely red with rage. And her child was in the back to witness it all. You knew right then and there you didn't even need to research this man's background. You were going to kill him. And so you did doing what you had to do by flirting with him just enough that he didn't even hesitate when you strictly asked him over to your house. The act disgusted you, but you reminded yourself that you'd soon bear fruit. And you did. It was all too easy. Better yet, you feared getting caught since sleeping with an employee could 
again fired, so he lay low on the on the way over. First, he tried getting handsy as soon as he opened the door, but she managed to shove a beer into his hand before he could pry her shirt off and then lead him inside, waiting for an opportune moment to strike. He downed a good portion of the beer in a matter of minutes, not even processing the odd taste, but she tried to wait out the effects of the drug in the bathroom to avoid him touching you again. When he came back, you could see him trying to get up and off the couch, but stumbling. In that moment, as his back remained facing you, you went haywire. Your body tumbled to the floor as you charged at him, burying the blade deep into his back, releasing in the bastard's screams and his evil attempts to crawl away. He wails in pain and anguish, were slurred, and he asked you over and over again why you were doing this, unable to comprehend why anyone would bring him harm, desperately pleading for her help and someone to come and save him. But no one could hear his cries because your entire house is soundproof. Not to mention you live far out of the city for this entire reason, using the complete solitude in order to avoid any potential witnesses. I felt his body grow weaker and weaker as he plunged the blade into him over and over and over again. You're lost in a feather. A crescendo of your emotions at an all-time high has tears streaked down your cheeks in empathy for his wife and child. Die, 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 die. The word repeated itself in a vicious cycle through your head as you tore steel through flesh. It didn't stop until he realized his body had gone cold and he lie limp beneath you. You're breathing hard as you pull back. Letting your head tip back as you soaked in the moment of relief after doing what you set out to do yet again. People like him always asked, why? Why are you hurting me? What did I ever do to deserve this? None of them self-reflected or repented or begged for forgiveness for their previous actions. You are the sensible, senseless killer. You have your reasons. People who, you who wind up on the receiving end of your knife are terrible people. Simple as that. From domestic abusers to sex traffickers to those who torture animals. The end of the receiving end of your ballistic knife. Of course, it's the same one you can bring with you today since it's still covered in DNA evidence from yesterday. Not to mention the authorities are no doubt looking for this thing, so it's within your best interest to keep this thing squared away for safekeeping in order to avoid any suspicion from coming your way. Usually, you try not to have any connection with your victims, but after seeing what you did, you couldn't help but want to take down your bastard with manager. Now he's six feet under. Because of that, his wife and kid are free from his constant abuse. The downside? He's your problem now. You sighs you turn towards the tub. Yeah, no. That's a problem for later because you, because no matter how many times you've done this, which is well to the double digits, you always get queasy at the sight of so much gore. The only reason you can handle it during a kill is because of the adrenaline coursing through your body. Otherwise, you want to hurl just like the customer who ruined your uniform did. You go with knife cleaning first and let the water run over the steel of the blade, imagining a hopeful future for your manager's kids in life, where they didn't live in fear of constantly making the wrong move. Innocent people deserve protection from the monsters around them. Innocent people like Raymond's wife and kids and... Theodore flashed through your mind. Yes. You're certain he's gone through pain because of someone who took advantage of that innocence and there's no doubt people like that in his life who are going to continue to do so. You want to protect people exactly like Theodore. Those scars, the ones underneath his mask that he revealed to you in that vulnerable moment weren't scars left behind by an accident or a birth. Those were intentional. You glad out your now clean knife. You're determined to find out who made them and end their existence. Because keeping people like him safe is a good you chose to do for the world. It's unconventional, frowned upon, disturbing, but you're determined regardless to find and eliminate every vile stranger you can find. Oh wow, that was crazy. I never expect <laughs> I never expected our character to actually be the killer, but the businessman? The businessman is what I'm still confused about, like 
I guess he was also like a killer, but like why did he specifically go to like our character's home? Like did he know or like it's just weird and he tossed a rose at at us? Like that's what I'm so confused about. But I guess this game just really plays into the theme of like not everyone is who they seem like just because someone looks good doesn't mean that they're like a crazy not a crazy still considered a killer someone looks innocent doesn't seem strong like isn't a killer and someone who seems like a killer like um theodore and well, with this huge build and like the creepy mask he was wearing the mask was really creepy maybe he wore a different mask it wouldn't be bad but the mask was creepy let's be honest here like he was really he's just a sweet guy in the end but uh yeah i enjoyed this game of raw the twists were interesting i'm trying to think of the manager like how did he get a job he went to prison before how do you get a job as a manager it's beyond me i'm trying to figure that out too but thank you guys so much for watching this video i hope you enjoyed it bye